morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Did you ever have one of those days? <laughs> no, you have. Uh, I have them too sometimes. So, <sighs> lots of prayers this morning. God is speaking. Uh, and it's a, it's, a little, it's a little hard sometimes. So, if you've looked ahead, you know that um, the scripture that I'm preaching on today is one of those hard sayings that we we don't like to hear. Um, so I told Jack, our office manager, man, the next three weeks are all tough sayings. And so she found this picture of tough rocks is what we're calling this series. And I like how uh, the rocks are stacked up in this in this picture. But we all have those days. We all have those times that we go through. Um, when I was a kid, I have one brother and three younger sisters. And so we were always watching to see who got the bigger piece of cake, who got the bigger dessert. And if somebody said, hey, your piece is bigger than mine, we'd say, tough rocks. And we'd laugh and go on. The next time, it might be that, you know, I got the bigger piece, and, and, and uh, they're all like, well, you got the biggest piece, and I'm like, tough rocks. It wasn't very kind. It wasn't very sympathetic. But it did show you that life is... Not always easy. Life is unfair sometimes, um, and we learn that at a young age. Well, in reading the Gospel of Luke, it struck me that these uh, next few lessons that, that we're going to talk about, uh, Jesus is basically saying tough rocks. I mean, if I were to sum up today's Gospel lesson, it's hate your mom and dad, give up all your stuff, and follow Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that attractive? No. And if somebody complained or said, Jesus, I just don't get this, it's like tough rocks. Life isn't fair or easy. Well, you know that all scripture is given to us for our, our edification, for the glory of God. There's got to be some good, hard teaching in here. So we have to dig a little bit. We have to dig a little bit to find out what that is. So we're doing that today and the next couple of weeks. Um, in order to grow as Christ's disciples. Let's pray. God, thank you for waking us up and bringing us here, for having the courage to step through this door into a sanctuary, into a sacred space. Prepare our hearts to hear your word. Help us to uh, be open to what it might be saying to us. God, uh, let us be so vulnerable that we're not tough as rocks, but that we are able to be formed as clay is formed into something useful, into your disciples. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So will you stand to your feet as you're able or rise in spirit to, um, and join me in the, the call to worship and the opening prayer? Now, friends, if you've looked at the... the bulletin, you'll see there's a blank space that's for you to fill in um, where it says we work as, just shout out whatever you do or um, if you're retired, maybe what you used to do or something like that, but we're all going to make a glorious noise together are you ready? alright, well God you have bound us together in the, this life give us the grace to understand how our lives depend on the courage, the industry, the honesty, and the integrity of all who labor. We work as teachers, and we serve Christ in all we do. Oh, you did gloriously. This is our, our, our tribute to Labor Day, um, because we all labor in some ways. Let's pray together. Dear God, Thank you for those with whom we work alongside. May we be mindful of their needs, grateful for their faithfulness, and faithful in our responsibilities to them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are finishing up our summer scenes with um, the hymns that you've requested, so you can have the first one, right? Love lifted me. Let's join you.
been here and left us white rocks. <laughs> no, not the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Probably goes who did it. Um, anyway, we don't usually have rocks up here, but I'm talking about rocks, and if you looked in the bulletin, look at these rocks. What's different about them? There's a stack of them, isn't it? Somebody stacked them up sort of like building blocks. Have you ever tried to stack rocks? They're all different sizes and shapes, so it's a little hard to do. But um, you can, there's water here. You can tell they're at the beach. I've seen these stacks of rocks at, at various beaches. Friends, at, at, in your travels, if you go to a, a beach or a lakeshore, have you ever seen some, a stack of rocks that somebody left and you've discovered it? Um, I was like, how did they do that? But I have not tried to do it, but it looks pretty hard. I mean, I can get like maybe three rocks, perhaps. Um, I'm talking about rocks today because rocks are hard things, aren't they? Hard things. They're not soft and squishy. It's not a marshmallow I got here. And sometimes life is hard. So, Friends, when you come up for communion, I'm going to invite each one of you to take a rock and um, take it home with you and decorate it. I took this one last night and I decorated, what does it say, Ava? Can you read that word? I wrote one of my favorite words on here. I wrote joy. And then what's on the other side? Evelyn, what is that? It's a heart. Yeah. So I'm going to invite you to take a rock, take it home with you and decorate it. I just wrote on it with a Sharpie marker. But um, you can use crayons or paints or whatever you might have at home. And bring it back with you next week. So, can you remember that? To bring it back? All right. Can you all remember to bring a rock back with you? Okay. Because we're going to do something with rocks for the next three Sundays. So, I want you to, every week it's going to be something different. So, this week is take a rock. Next week is bring back a rock that you wrote a special word, a blessing, you, you colored it, you did something to it, okay? Um, so thank you for that. And I think we, I like rocks. I, they remind us that even when times are rocky, things are hard, God is with us. And when you read the Bible, there's all kinds of stories about rocks in there. And lots of times the people would pile up the rocks as a reminder that God was with them during that hard time. So this is not a new idea. There's stories in the Bible about the, the piles of rocks. Um, so we're going to talk more about that later. But today, because I gave, I put joy on my rock, I've got a little card for you. And that says joy. And then, Ava, can, you're a reader, right? Can you read what the J stands for? Jesus, right. And then O is for others. What's a Y? Can you read that one? Yourself, that's right. So, another way to think of that word joy is Jesus, others, and yourself. And that's how we're called to love, okay? Let's have our prayer. Friends, will you help us to pray? Dear God, Dear God, thanks for loving us. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for sending us joy. Thanks for sending us joy. And reminding us that you are always with us. And reminding us that you are always with us. Help us to share your love.
from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Would you stand out of respect for the Gospel and join me in the prayer? O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Jesus at his word, believing that hatred of family and friends and 
even life itself is a requirement for discipleship. Or we can assume that Jesus was just overstating his case to make a point. You know, he does that. He uses hyperbole, he tells stories, he, he, he makes things <coughs> bigger to make a point. So, but, so in order to understand this, we got to dig into what those words really mean, the words that Jesus used. And I'll tell you, the sheer weight of history behind Jesus. I mean, people have been, been puzzling over this for 2,000 years, trying to understand what he was saying, what he was meaning. He must be very, very important. And so we look at the actual words that Jesus used. I mean, Jesus says we must hate family, even life itself, in order to be his disciples. Hate is a word that you can't ignore. So what was he meaning by this? Well, the easiest way out of this mess, hang with me friends, is to look at that definition of the word that Jesus actually used to kind of try to wriggle out of that hate box. This is awfully harsh. So I looked into the, the actual uh, Greek and Hebrew words that, that were used in the Bible. Um, the Greek word in our text is messiah. So M E sorry M I S E I, and it's related to our words miserable and misanthrope. So unfortunately, it's really as bad as it sounds. I mean, you must hate, you must detest family and life in order to be Jesus' disciples. There, there's no wiggle room in the original text. So. It's a word you can't ignore. So it seems like relying on maybe this is overstated or hyperbole, it won't let us out of the box. Apparently, we are supposed to take Jesus at his word, even when that word is offensive to our ears, attacks the very core of who we are. I mean, then we have to ask, in what manner must I hate my father and mother? In what way must I hate my brother and sisters, my spouse, and my children? How must I hate my life in order to be your disciple, Jesus? Don't you wish Jesus was here and we could ask those very questions? I mean, it's painful to hear these words. It's hard for me to say, I've got some of my beloved family here. I can't really look at them and say, I must hate you. I hate the thought of hating the people that I love. up in an instant 
if we could. We hate our burdens, our shortcomings, our annoyances, our fears. I'm really fearful of snakes, that's why I had to talk about it. We, are, we hate our disappointments. So if Jesus told us that being his disciple meant to give these things up, man, we would do it in a moment, right? I, I give up liquor gladly. <laughs> That's really the problem, though. We spend all our time trying to uh, get saved from the things that we hate. And we really need to get saved from the things that we love, the things that we idolize. The things that we cherish, even the things that we worship. Hang with me. In Jesus' time, your family was everything. Jesus talked a lot about caring for widows and orphans because widows and orphans literally had nothing, they had no one to care for them, they had no one to feed them, give them homes, see to their needs. If he didn't have a family, he didn't have anything. And yet, Jesus told his disciples if they wanted to follow him, they needed to hate their families. And as much as that is a shock to us today, it was even more shocking in Jesus' time. You just don't tell people those kind of things unless you really mean it. Because hate is a word you can't ignore. But Jesus said it. He said that you can't follow him and be captive to a family's love. Now, the Gospel of Luke tells us that there was a great crowd of people following Jesus. How many of them might have been just along for the ride? might have just wanted to see a good show. They heard about this guy. They heard about some healing miracles. They just wanted to see what would happen next. How many of them might have been thinking about signing on with Jesus, really being a follower of Jesus, um, if his teachings were too crazy, and if there was a miracle or two along the way, and that good show. I mean, how many of them, in other words, were just looking for an interesting experience, um, entertainment, uh, one more good teacher and a series of teachers, because there were always wandering rabbis in, in the land of Israel. In other words, how many of them really came looking for the Son of God Almighty? Maybe some good tricks, some healing things, and some good sayings, some good stories. <clears throat> so, in his book, Mere Christianity, which I highly recommend if you haven't read that, C.S. Lewis shows us the difference between curiosity and discipleship. He had a curious crowd following him. Jesus is trying to move them to discipleship. C.S. Lewis wrote, I'm going to. I'm here trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They'll say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. It is the one thing that you must not say. Think of it, friends. A man who was merely human and said the kind of things that Jesus did would not be a great moral teacher. He would be a lunatic. A crazy guy. On the level with a, a man who says he's a he's a poached egg or, or Santa Claus. Or else he would be the devil of hell. C.S. Lewis writes, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else he's a crazy man. Or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet. And call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. That's just one uh, paragraph out of this book, Mere Christianity. And if this is a book that is great for small groups and Sunday school classes to study and discuss. It really makes you think. Um, but it kind of catches you. You know, if you didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and he said,
saying all these things, he seems to be crazy, right? Jesus didn't leave us any wiggle room. Jesus said, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Well, you know what? I have a feeling that this word was not intended for all of his followers. See, it would be an easy thing to hate a father who drinks too much. It would be an easy thing to hate a mother who beats her children. It would be an easy thing to hate a spouse who despises us, children who neglect us, brothers and sisters who insult and injure us. But Jesus isn't speaking to any of those situations. There's no need for that. Because, see, as a Savior, Jesus came to rescue the lost and the forsaken. Those who struggle with abusive parents and neglectful children and dysfunctional families. But Jesus was Savior to us all. He came to save us from all the things that hold us captive, both good and bad. It's much harder to be saved from a good marriage, from a faithful spouse, respectful children. But Jesus came to save us from those things as well. Sometimes Jesus had to use strong words to shock us out of our comfort zones, to stop us ignoring him. And he used that word hate. And hate is a word can't ignore. Alright, hang in there, friends. To understand why Jesus did that, we have to go way back. Way back in history. Do you remember what happened after the Hebrew people left Egypt? Moses was leading them around the Sinai Peninsula. He's leading them out of Egypt into the promised land, Israel. Now, if you look on a map, those two are not that far apart in miles or kilometers or however they measure distance then. But for 40 years, Moses and these people wandered in the desert. They basically went around in circles. After 40 years, Moses is about to die. And the next leader, Joshua, would be the ones to lead the people across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. God had prepared these people by giving him, giving them the law. If you read this story, it says the law will fill your life with blessings if you follow it. You know, you know what law I'm talking about, right? The Ten Commandments. Okay, the Ten Commandments. We can find them in Deuteronomy chapter 5. I'm just going to run through them real quickly. I'm going to do it backwards anyway. Um, nine, check, uh, 9 and 10, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Uh, 8, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie. You, number 7, you shall not steal. Number 6, you shall not commit adultery. Number 5, you shall not kill. And number 4, honor your father and mother. If you imagine, that's on the second tablet. I don't know why I'm doing it backwards, just maybe to fix it up. But all of those commandments are how you deal with your neighbors, how you treat other people. The first tablet, uh, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And number one, I am the Lord your God. You will have no other gods before me. In all of these laws, God promises life, not as a reward for good behavior, but life as natural consequences of trusting God, of obeying God's commandments. I set before you your life and death, blessings and curses, God says. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. And then beginning with that first commandment, God shows us what it means to live and with whom that life must begin. See, friends, following Jesus means following only Jesus. We cannot follow Jesus and all the good things in our lives. There can be no split allegiances. This call to hatred, if you will, is really a call to understand that, that Christ alone can save to turn away from anything that would take his place. Even those things that are fair.
family or life itself. We can't follow Jesus and put our family or our work or our hobbies or our friends first. We must put God first in our lives.
Hear this answer. Jesus answers, I have redeemed you through baptism. And I will redeem you from those things that you love and those things that you hate. I will give you life abundant and everlasting now and in the kingdom to come. Oh, friends, that is the good news. Now and in the kingdom to come. Best of all, Jesus is with us. When things are rocky, when they're hard. So, when we pray to understand this teaching and to live it out, we don't get that on our own. But Jesus helps us even there. Amen. Lord, let it be so. Let it be so. As we are going deep into this discipleship and studying this, if you want to read this passage and, and think about it, I encourage you to do that in Luke chapter 14. Maybe write down some of those things that you hate. Maybe journal what you love. And then think about how following Jesus lets those things that we hate fall away and deepens our love for our family, for life itself. We can't do it on our own, so that we pray for help. In just a few moments, we're going to share the Lord's Supper. This is a tangible way that, that God makes God's presence known to us in the bread and in the cup. And I love to say that you do not get to be a member of the United Methodist Church. All are welcome to come up. Um, if you just want to come and receive a blessing, you can do that. Um, but do come forward. You can kneel at the prayer rail, uh, pick up a rock and take it with you. All are welcome. Let me pray for us. And then you join me in the Lord's prayer. God, we thank you for your presence here today, for all the ways that you make your, yourself known. And God does. We, sometimes we just want an easy life. We don't like the rocky stuff. But you have not called us to an easy life. Life is not fair or easy. But life is good, a good gift from you. You are with us even in our challenges. <clears throat> Help us never to forget that. And you love us and you accept us with your grace and mercy when we mess up. You take us as we are, but you don't leave us where you find us. You are always seeking to help us to grow, to become more like you, to be transformed in your likeness, to grow in love. God, we know we can't do it on our own. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to light this path, to show us the way, to challenge us, to save us. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Thank you. 
to give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and sovereign of the universe. You love the world so much that you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. He has suffered and died for the sin of this world. You raised him from the dead so that we too might have new life. He ascended to be with you in glory, and according to his promise, is with us always. On the night in which he offered himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we ask you to accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which we offer in union with Christ's sacrifice for us, as a living and holy surrender of ourselves. Send the power of the Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts, that in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of this cup, we may know the presence of the living Christ, be one body in Him, cleansed by His blood, faithfully serve Him in the world, and look forward to His coming in final days. Through Him, with Him, in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Kathy and Evelyn are going to come and assist me today. Friends, when you come up, um, uh, you come up and receive the bread and a uh, small cup of the of the juice. Um, you can then kneel at the prayer rail or return to your seat. Be sure to pick up a rock and hold on to that.
Let's join in the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this whole ministry in which you have given yourself to us. Grant
and we shine that love, love forward in our life. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.